I think of all the neuroscience researchers I know, you have one of the most wide ranging um, an eclectic set of interests and influences. What influences pre-neuroscience uh, do you think made you such, have you su have such eclectic research interests? Well, I began my career and still am an affiliate in the philosophy department. And one of the wonderful things about being a philosopher is that you get to think about all sorts of things. But I do think that even though on the surface, the interests that I have look wide ranging, there's a basic foundational problem that's always been, for my whole career, the problem that I'm concerned about. And that problem is, how is it that we know as much as we do about the world around us? So if you look at the world, we get a narrow little stream of photons at the back of our eyes, and, and yet somehow we end up knowing about a world full of people and objects and places and science and abstract things. And the big question for me has always been, how does that happen? How is that possible? It seemed to me that a, a very good way of answering that question was to look at children, because they're the ones who are doing that more than any other creatures that we know of. They're the ones who are actually taking that data and figuring out how the world works. And then that also leads to the question of trying to understand what's going on in their minds, what their motivations, what their brains and minds are like that enables them to do that so effectively. Once that's what you care about, you can think about how could you construct a computer that could do the same thing? And that's become very relevant because the great new AI spring has been about computers that can learn, that can take data and make sense out of it. You said that scientists at the time who were trying to understand how we come to understand the world weren't, didn't think that there was any point in looking at children. Right. They act as mini physicists or biologists and are actually able to come up with explanatory theories uh, that they can then use to make predictions about the world. My work and the work of a bunch of other developmental psychologists starting in the 70s and 80s really basically found new techniques for asking the question about what it is that children knew. First, we discovered that children understand things about other people's minds. Um, children were supposed to be solipsistic and egocentric, and starting in the late 80s, a number of developmental psychologists started saying, is that really true? What do children understand about what's going on in other people's minds? And we discovered that even, even young babies are trying to figure out what's happening in other people's minds. So were there ways that we could ask them in their language instead of our language what they know? And when we did that, the sort of things that we would do is look at what they do, look at how they act to try and help someone else. So uh, the experiment you were talking about, very clever experiment by Felix Warnikin, who's now at University of Michigan, he showed that if you took even an 18-month-old and you dropped a pencil on the floor, the 18-month-olds would come and give it to you, but not if you threw it to the floor, which means that they were both inferring something about what you wanted and also actively trying to get you something that you wanted. What are some of the other ways in which studying how zero to 10-year-olds learn could help us design AIs better? Right. So. One way that I like to put it now is if you think, look at our current AIs, they're a bit like children who have super hyper helicopter, helicopter tiger moms. So they have programmers who are saying, here's your score, get your score higher. And the great discovery of machine learning in the last 10 years has been you don't actually have to say, get your score higher by doing this. You just tell them, get your score higher, give them a bunch of statistical data and billions of examples, they can figure out how to do it themselves. In some ways, babies are like the opposite of that. So with very small amounts of data, very messy data, not well curated data, they seem to be able to learn principles that are m much more generalizable, that they can apply in many more different circumstances. So the puzzle is what is it that they're doing that's letting them, letting them do that in a way that current AIs can't? The three things that children, that we know babies are doing that current AIs are not very good at doing are model building, so actually building, this goes back to the work um, I did in the 80s, building theories, ideas about how the world works, explaining how the world works, not just predicting. Um, they're curious, they're exploratory, so the AIs are kind of stuck inside of their mainframes. We can feed them data, but they can't sort of go out and get data for themselves. The third thing is learning socially. So babies are learning from other people and they're extremely tuned into what other people are doing. They imitate other people, they listen to what other people say, but they don't just do this in a kind of simple, mindless way, they do it in a very sophisticated way. So we're taking some basic problems like figuring out how objects work or how people work and then trying to see could we get an AI that is curious, is intrinsically motivated? Could we get an AI that 
can learn from other people, can imitate them and imitate intelligently? Can we get an AI that explains things, that tries to make up models, doesn't just, uh, doesn't just predict things? The curiosity, it, it, do you imagine a, um, that a machine learning algorithm could actually tell its humans feed me a different kind of corpus of yeah, information? There's, or? there's beautiful work that my colleagues at Berkeley, um, Pukit Agarwal and Deepak Palthik and uh, Trevor Darrell and Anjushendra Malik and Ayush Efres have done, um, of actually designing. So one of the big techniques in current machine learning is reinforcement learning. So that's what I was saying, you know, you have an alpha go, it gets a score on an Atari game, let's say, and then it tries to, it gets reinforced for getting a higher score, and then it tries to figure out how to get more reinforcement. Um, the very clever design that they have is a system that is trying to build a model of the world, like kind of like predictive coding, trying to predict the world, but it also gets reinforced when it fails. So it's going around essentially trying to find things that are surprising, trying to find things that don't fit with the way the world works. And it gets a little, as it were, shot of you know AI dopamine when, when it's surprised, when things are weird, when things don't work. And it turns out that that kind of a system first of all, does really explore the space, and it does it in a more robust way than uh, the helicopter um, AI that is just, you know, following the trail of breadcrumbs yeah. of the rewards. So one of the really basic ideas that's in AI and computation in lots of areas is something that's called an explore-exploit trade-off. And the phenomenon is there's an intrinsic trade-off between what you need to do to be most effective, most efficient, get something done quickly and effectively, and what you need to do to explore the space of possibilities. And you can kind of, you know, think, see why that's true, right? I mean, there's a big giant space of possibilities. Only one of them is actually, or a small set is actually gonna be the one that's gonna work. How do you do that? How do you explore possibilities? While you're exploring them, you're not actually effectively mm -hmm. solving the problem. But when you're solving the problem, you're not exploring all the mm -hmm. other ways that mm -hmm. you could solve the problem. So there's been some really interesting work trying to see what humans do. And adult humans go back and forth between different kinds of ways of trying to solve the problem. But it's really challenging. So finally, um, you came from philosophy and then went into brain science. Right. What, what is consciousness? So I think that's one of those ones where the answer is that it's a bad question, that philosophers, this is an old philosopher trick, right? Um, but I do think that's, a, a, that's true in this case. I think what's, who knows what the answer is gonna be, but I think it's very unlikely that there's gonna be one answer. Perhaps not coincidentally, um, the people who have thought about consciousness tend to focus on the kind of consciousness you have when you're an adult philosopher sitting in your armchair thinking about consciousness, which kind of makes sense. But that's really different from the consciousness that you have when you're a baby looking around in the world. Very different from the kind of, I think the, the recent work on psychedelics has given us a lovely kind of um, demonstration of the fact that you can have a kind of consciousness that's very different from that sort of professorial, self-reflective consciousness. You can have a consciousness, the characteristic of which is that you don't feel a difference between yourself and the world anymore, right? When you start casting your net more widely, thinking about animals, thinking about children, thinking about what people call altered states, although I think actually those may be the sort of baseline states from which professorial consciousness is the kind of alter alteration, uh, you get a, a much more varied, much less predictable, but much richer view of what's yeah. going on.